Okay, uh, we have started our recording once again. Uh, so we will get into the book of Genesis. Before we do that, we you know we have one, one pending verse which we read out, but we didn't talk about it. And that was Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. We saw that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, the original Old Testament was arranged in a particular way. You had the Torah, and then you had the prophetic books, which are called the Nevi'im. And you had the third section, which was the writings, the historical writings and the poetic writings. Uh, that, would, that was the Kevtuvim. And we saw that in this arrangement, Chronicles will be your very last book. Okay, So it's what we saw. Now that is directly connected to what is mentioned over here in Matthew 23, verse 35. Jesus is speaking to the leaders. And he's saying, you people are an unrepentant people. You know, every time the good news was brought to you, you chose to kill the person bringing the good news. So even the prophets, the prophets came to you and prophesied about how the Messiah will come, how he will deliver. And all you need to do from your side is repent and prepare your hearts. You, you refuse to do that. What was your response? He says to the people, you know, he says, what was your response? He says, you people killed the prophets who were sent. And so he says, on this generation which is now living, I, you know, it, uh, all the pending judgment which has been pending for centuries, all the, go, go, uh, all the people of God whom you have murdered, you and your ancestors, because of the wrong attitude of your hearts, that judgment which has been waiting, it's going to be released now in your times is what he says. And so as he's talking about the judgment which will come upon them, this is what he says. These are the words that he uses. Jesus says, and so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So Jesus is basically saying all these books of the Old Testament, which give details about what you people did to the prophets. What is the first murder that is mentioned? It is the murder of Abel. Abel was righteous. Cain, on the other hand, was living in a way that did not please the Lord. And so God accepted the sacrifice of Abel, but God rejected the sacrifice of Cain because he was not living in a way which was honorable and acceptable to the Lord. And God says to him, he says, if you change your, you know, uh, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So God is saying, you don't have to be angry and upset that I, that I uh, you know, have shown favor to Abel. All you have to do is do what is right. If you do that, you also will be accepted. And um, uh, so Cain, instead of admitting his wickedness and, you know, um, repenting, he chooses to kill the righteous person instead. So right from that time, right from the beginning, you have the attitude of some people who will choose rebellion rather than repentance. Cain had a choice. He could either repent or he could rebel. He chose to rebel and he chose to murder righteous Abel. So it, it started off with that. And so in every generation, you would have people who chose to kill the righteous rather than repent of their evil ways. Um, I just hope it's not someone trying to ask a question. Okay, so, um, so the very last murder of a righteous person, which is mentioned in the Old Testament, you know, according to their arrangement of books, is in the Second Chronicles, where it talks about the death of Zechariah. So the first book, the first murder, that would be Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And the very last murder which is mentioned in the Hebrew Old Testament at the end, somewhere around the end of the Second Chronicles. That will be Second Chronicles 24, verses 20 to 22. Second Chronicles 24, verses 20 to 22. 
so once we understand how their books were arranged how their old testament books were arranged we get a clearer idea of why jesus used that term from the blood of abel to the blood of zechariah he was basically talking about from the first murder in the old testament up to the last murder in the old testament of a righteous person so the people chose to kill the righteous rather than repent of their sins okay so um so we looked very briefly about the language of the old testament the original old testament and we looked at the arrangement of the books in the old testament and we also looked at the portions which were given more importance during public readings during festivals so we just dwelt upon those three brief points as an introduction now we will move into our uh, you know study of genesis the book of genesis belongs to the first section which is your torah so the torah is made up of five books and the very first one is um uh genesis and um now the word genesis which we use uh, that is actually uh, the the heading the name that was given to the book in the latin translation of the bible you know um in very early times when the you know um, when was it 1100s 1200s when they began to do translations of the bible um when the latin version was um, you know um was what well, translation for the Lat latin bible was done at that time they gave each of the books a name so these words many of them actually make more sense if you know latin of course none of us know latin but you know that word genesis basically means something that is being um generated for the first time it is it is coming into existence for the first time so the word genesis basically means um the birth of something the beginning of something that's the word that's the latin word so uh we use these um latin headings even even today uh, so the book of genesis is actually a book of many many beginnings um if you look in your pdf you know the notes which are uh, posted online and also the copies which you have over here it gives you a, lo a long list of all the beginnings which we find in the book of genesis it was the beginning of creation there was no world in existence before that for the first time the entire world the universe was created so the beginning of the universe is mentioned the beginning of human beings god created humans for the very first time um the beginning of the sabbath when did the sabbath begin did it begin on the day when moses said thou shalt keep the sabbath did the sabbath actually begin on that day or did the sabbath begin much before that it says on the seventh day god rested and then when moses is explaining why we people should follow the sabbath or rather why the old testament people should follow the sabbath at that time moses explains and he, he reminds them remember on the seventh day god rested from the creation process that word rested basically means he stopped he 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 um he ended what he was doing so that word rested is an old english word it's not talking about rest and taking rest and sleeping no god was not tired uh, he was not trying to rest because he was tired he rested in the sense he stopped he ended what needed to be done it was all complete and so he rested he stopped from doing it if i'm doing white washing of this entire hall once i have finished the white washing of the entire hall i will rest from my work doesn't mean that i'm tired it means that i have finished and completed the task and so in that sense i have rested from it so moses reminds the people and says remember on the seventh day god rested from his work that is the reason why we are celebrating the sabbath there was a significance for that we will talk about it later when we are you know covering those portions so there's a there's a there's a special significance which connects the sabbath to the seventh day um how in what other sense is genesis a book of beginnings 
it is the beginning of the in institution of marriage god created this institution of marriage that is the beginning of marriage um it is also the beginning of the fall of sin the beginning of sin we find in the book of genesis it was also the beginning of sacrifices because humans fell because they sinned when god had to do something for them he had to make a sacrifice on their behalf uh, to you know to uh, to uh, to forgive them and so he introduces the whole system of sacrifices so that was the beginning genesis is also the beginning of nations different different nations came into existence for the first time in the book of genesis so in that sense the book of genesis is a book of many new beginnings um who are the main characters that we see in the book of genesis in the beginning of course we have adam and eve and then you have cain and abel and then you have a whole bunch of names which we can't remember uh noah stands out in our mind we remember noah he's one of the um, you know important characters that we remember and then later you have uh, Uh, again a whole bunch of people and then we come to the chapters you know uh, chapter uh, 12 onwards where we have the stories of abraham isaac jacob and joseph so those characters we remember they are the main characters that we remember from the book of uh, genesis now when exactly was the book of genesis written if we look at first kings chapter 6 verse 1 over there uh, a little bit of information is given regarding date you know so using that information they try to calculate when the book of genesis must have been written so let's look at first kings chapter 6 verse 1 If someone can read out First Kings chapter six verse one, verse one. And it came to pass in the four hundred and eighteenth year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziv. which is the second month that he began to build the house of the lord here the dating has been given basically for when the temple construction work started solomon's temple when solomon began his temple construction work but it also gives us some information about how many years after the exodus this took place what is that word exodus that's basically a word which means leaving from some place let us say that for some reason my family has been asked by the government to leave bangalore and go away permanently so when i and my family are leaving bangalore we will say we are we are uh, you know making an exodus from bangalore we will never come back over here we are saying goodbye to this place forever and ever so it's a very ancient big word exodus it basically means you are now leaving something permanently and going away you are exiting from that place so maybe if the you know uh, this latin version was written in in modern times we would not call this exodus we would call it exit they are exiting a place leaving it going away to a new place okay that word exodus basically means that so um from first kings chapter 6 verse 1 we get to know that 480 years after the exodus this um temple construction work begins so using that for calculation uh, you know the scholars they try to calculate when genesis might have been approximately written and uh, so depending on which commentary or you're looking at you'll probably get a slightly different date but up approximately sometime let us say 1500 uh, uh, you know uh, bc just to kind of round it off some people will say 140 uh, 1405 bc um, in your book i think in your in your pdf it mentions um, 1486 bc so approximately around that time is when the book of genesis must have been written 
yeah exactly so that, that is when it was written and um, it was written most probably by moses and why did god choose moses to write it because moses had very advanced writing skills okay uh, this is something that we see mentioned in the new testament acts 7 verse 22 talks about moses talks about his academic background moses was not an un uneducated person he was a highly learned person acts 7 22 talks about that if someone can read out Acts 7 22 and moses was learned in all the wisdom of egyptian and was mighty in words and deeds yeah uh, this is basically from the speech of stephen stephen is giving them a brief history of their entire you know background israelites background and he's talking about the main things which happened and so when he's talking about moses he says moses he was such a learned man but he chose to place god first and so we get to know that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of Egypt. So he also would have learned how to write historical you know, records. Because if you, if you look at the Egyptian literature, when they talk about their kings, when they talk about their, uh, you know, uh, their civilization, uh, you know, they, the way they wrote, they had a particular writing style uh, of recording historical events. Moses would have learned all those skills during that time. You know, if God had come to one of us sitting over here in the class and said, I want you to write down the first five books, you would not even know how to do it. I mean, how do you, how do you start writing something like that? Moses didn't have that problem. He had already been trained in such things. He knew how to write. And another thing which, which is interesting, I know it's a little beside the point, but you know, just to touch upon that, uh, this is what Stephen says about Moses. He, say, uh, he says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. He was a powerful speaker. What does Moses say about himself? He says, oh, I can't even talk. Lord, you please choose somebody else. Uh, where does he make up all those excuses? That is in Exodus chapter 4. Is where he says, No, no, Lord, don't make me go to the Pharaoh. I can't talk to the Pharaoh. I don't know how to talk. But history records, you know, because they would have had uh, access to all these historical books which talk about, uh, you know, their people. So Stephen had read those books. So Stephen was aware of, uh, of, um, Moses, very learned, educated background. And so he records and says, Moses was skilled. You know, he was powerful in speech and action. But when Moses is talking to God, he actually, so now we get to know why God became angry. It says in Exodus chapter 4, uh, verse 14, it says, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Why? Because Moses was giving all lame excuses. These were not genuine excuses. When he said, I'm slow of speech, I don't know how to talk, you know, he was actually not speaking the truth about himself. He was scared to face Pharaoh. He was thinking that if I go and stand in front of Pharaoh, maybe all my words will escape from my mind and my mind will go blank. So he was, it was more fear. It was not lack of education or lack of skill. And that's why God becomes angry and upset that he's not willing to do it. Okay, so, so Moses was skilled enough to record the first five books. In the same way, in the, when you come to the New Testament, God chooses a person who's very skilled in writing. You know, if you look at many of the epistles, they were written by one single person, Paul. And Paul was trained by whom? He was trained uh, under one of the best teachers available at that time, Gamaliel. So Gamaliel would have taught him how to talk, how to write, you know, how to develop an argument, or, you know, and, and present your case in writing, all these things he would have been taught. So in the Old Testament, you have Moses writing first, the first five books. In the New Testament, in the same way, you have a very skilled person writing many of the main doctrinal truths, you know, in the 
epistles. Uh, so um, Moses was a very skilled person, and he would have known how to write these five books. Um, also, we see that he, you know, he gives a lot of genealogies uh, in the book of uh, Genesis. It gives uh, um, many records of uh, the descendants of Adam and Eve. You know, it gives a long list who was born after whom. And then you have a genealogy which talks about the descendants of Shem, the descendants of Ham. You know, all these genealog genealogical lists. From where did Moses get the uh, the information for from for all of these? You know, so some of those records would have been maintained by the Israelite people, but some of those records also would have been there in the Egyptian library. You know, where they would have maintained a record of all the uh, genealogies and things like that. So Moses, who had access to the royal court, would be familiar with these things. So it was easy for him to put down all these details in the first five books, you know, of the uh, of the Old Testament. Um, coming to the three main uh, divisions which we find in the book of Genesis, we can say that Genesis chapters one to eleven is is one main. Uh, you know, section, because this is basically where you have all the initial introductory events taking place. You have the creation, you have the fall, uh, you have you have the flood, the Noah's flood is there. All these things are uh, mentioned in the first 11 chapters. So from chapter 3 onwards, sin starts growing, sin starts increasing. Till finally, when you come to Genesis chapter, you know, uh, eight, nine, the people have become so sinful that God is uh, not pleased with them anymore. And so it, God decides, I will wipe out all of this human, uh, you know, humankind, and I will choose one family and restart, you know, so that once again, godliness will be reestablished. And so he, uh, God arranges for the flood. And uh, all the people, uh, you know, they perish. And one single family from that single family, again, you know, humanity uh, starts, uh, you know, multiplying. Uh, so we see all that recorded in the first 11 chapters. The second main section of our book of Genesis, that would be chapters 12 to 36. In these chapters uh, 12 to 36, is basically where you have um, you know, this detailed discussion of the stories of Abraham, and then you have uh, Isaac. So all of their stories are recorded um, in chapters 12 up to chapter 36. And then the last portion would be chapters 37 to 50, because over here you see um, the stories of how God saves his people you know under the during the time of joseph how they are able to go to egypt and god provides for you know uh, food and provision during the time of famine all those things are there in your last section so 1 to 11 can be the first main section then you have chapters 12 to 36 and finally you have uh, chapters 37 to 50 which is the last portion just to touch upon very briefly upon this middle section, you know, chapters 12 to 36, uh, with chapter 12, you know, it talks about how God chooses Abraham. Abraham obeys to go uh, and settle in a new place because God promises him that land. Uh, so it explains in Genesis chapter 18 why God chooses Abraham to be that leader. Why God, God could have chosen any family and started his Israelite nation from that person. Why did God specifically choose Abraham as the person through whom his chosen people will be formed? If you turn to Genesis chapter 18, verses 18 to 19, there's, an, uh, there's something nice that God says about Abraham over here. Uh, Genesis 18, 18 to 19. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for i have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the lord to do righteousness and justice that the lord may bring to abraham what he has spoken to him 
uh, God says over here in verse 19, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. God believed that this is one man who will be sincere enough to train his family members and also the descendants you know, who are going to come after them in such a way that a special nation starts getting formed. One special group of people who are willing to follow the ways of God and keep the instructions of God. If God had chosen some other person, maybe that man would not have the discipline level, the integrity level to actually, you know, mold and shape his family members. Um, this is probably not a very nice thing to say over here to the physical class sitting over here because we seem to have, except for two women, we have only we have all men over here. But generally, if you have noticed, right from the time of Genesis, men seem to have the impression that when it comes to training up the children in spiritual matters, the wife will look out, take care of it. She's the one who will tell them bedtime stories from the Bible. And then as they start growing up, she'll start teaching them a little more of the Bible. She'll pray with them. So somehow, from ancient times, the wrong impression was that spiritual nurture of the children is mommy's department. Daddy has got important things to do. He has to go and make money. He has to make, you know, develop contacts with people so that uh, you know, the family can prosper. So it was assumed that the man is, has better things to do, important things to do. The wife can take care of the spiritual nurture of the children. It's the wrong impression that was there. And here God says, I mean, this is what this is the value that God places on spiritual instruction. Here God says, I'm choosing this man, Abraham, because I know that he is one person who will direct his children and also the household after him, because these children will grow up and they should be able to pass on what they have learned to the next generation. So Abraham took care to be a good spiritual leader. It is, it is good that he was able to start off the, you know, um, the nation of Israel, that he was the patriarch through whom the entire nation came uh, because of his faithfulness. So yes, we admire him for his faith, but he was also the man who considered spiritual matters important enough that he took the time to teach his family and to teach the people who came after that about the value of following God and keeping his ways. If he had not done that, Israel would not never have formed. They also would be just like all the other nations. And a special people would not have been created out of which the Messiah can come. So Abraham actually played a very important role by being a spiritual leader in his home, in his family. Uh, we see that about him. Okay, so... Um, so we just talked very briefly about the three sections which are there in Genesis. Um, maybe just to address some particular things which are mentioned in your textbook, you know, in your PDF. Um, there's um, usually at the end of each uh, book, you know, it will mention unique features of this particular book. For instance, you know, you have a um, subheading which says unique features of Genesis. Um, over there, it talks about three unconditional covenants that God made under the under your subheading of unique features. And uh, so the first unconditional covenant which God made was the Abrahamic covenant. When God made a covenant uh, through Moses, you know, the, the covenant of Moses, at that time, God put conditions. He said, if you do this, 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 then I will be faithful to you. I will cause you to prosper. I will bless you. So God attached some conditions when he gave the covenant through Moses. But the Abraham covenant, there are no conditions attached. God just says to him, because you have trusted me, it's enough. I will now, you know, make you into a nation. So there are no conditions attached for the Abrahamic covenant. There's only one single requirement. 
that that person should place their faith in this living god that's the only condition which is you know uh, laid down uh, so the abrahamic covenant was the first unconditional covenant that was established um and um, the next two are actually the davidic covenant and the new testament covenant which we have now uh, these are the three un unconditional covenants that are given uh, where it's mainly just faith faith is the only thing that is required if you believe in me i will do this for you okay it's the, that's the basis um in your textbook it also there's a comparison given where uh, you know they would compare that particular book which we are studying with the other books of the bible so there's a comparison bit given between the book of genesis and the other bible books um there are many many things mentioned over there but just to touch upon one particular detail uh where it compares genesis with john and first john the statement that is given in your you know in your pdf it says over there genesis began with creation but john and first john they began before creation itself and uh, it's interesting because if you look at the very first verse of genesis what does it say over the genesis chapter 1 verse 1 it says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth so the book of genesis starts off with creation but when you go to john what does it say in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god at that time creation had not happened so we are talking about a time which was before creation the same thing even in first john 11 uh, if you look at first john 11 it says that which was from the beginning it's talking again about jesus christ and how he was there even before the creation so that's one interesting comparison which they bring out in the same way they try to compare genesis with many of the other books of the bible uh, another thing which i um, which is nice in your pdf um, is this last portion at the end of each book you know you will have something called the shadow of christ in that particular book okay so the shadow of christ in the book of genesis uh, what does this term mean they basically say in the book of genesis these are the people these are the objects these are the events which point towards christ they are like shadows and the shadows are pointing towards the person okay so that's basically how the term shadow is used for instance um you know if i see a shadow of a person then i know that next the actual person will come okay so if i'm just looking maybe if i'm standing near a door and i see one shadow you know in in your the door i know that there is a person who's coming next you know with that shadow so i first see the shadow and then i see the actual person to whom the shadow belongs so using that kind of an imagery in the book of genesis are there any people which are pointing towards christ are there any events which are pointing towards christ are there even any objects or things which are pointing towards christ so you would find that in each of the uh, you know in each chapter in your pdf where at the end of the book it will talk about the shadow of christ in that particular uh, book so um, there are three main shadows mentioned over here in you know in your notes the first of course is adam uh, it says adam is a type of christ so adam how did adam point towards jesus christ in what way is adam pointing towards jesus um maybe we can just you uh, know you can take down one single verse for that first corinthians 15 verse 45 first corinthians 15 verse 45 Yeah, uh, yeah. If someone can read out, fifteen forty-five. Uh, forty-five, forty-five. Yeah. And so it is written: the first man, Adam, became a living being; the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Yeah. So here it's making a comparison between Adam and Christ. 
So in what way is Adam pointing towards Jesus Christ? Adam was the one through whom the human mankind started. He was the first created being and from him all other humans followed. But what did this first Adam do? Instead of being a blessing and a help to, the, his, to his descendants, he rather brought the curse of sin upon them. So the first Adam, he actually, he failed us. He did, uh, what he did was not good for us. But then it talks about another kind of Adam who came. And it says he's the last Adam, the final Adam. He undid all the damage which the first Adam had done. So the first Adam messed up everything, made life impossible for humans, you know, uh, cut off their relationship with God. Because of the first Adam, so much destruction came into the world. But the final Adam, he came and once for all finalized and destroyed all the wrong, you know, uh, things which had come into the world. And he started a new process, the kingdom establishment as a result of which slowly, little by little, all that has been destroyed will start being restored. So the final Adam undid the damage which the first Adam had done. Uh, so, so you can say that Adam is pointing towards Christ, is pointing towards a better Adam, someone who will be better than him in representing the people you know, in, a, uh, in a manner that will be a blessing to them. Uh, the second uh, shadow that we can see is the skin of the animals that have been sacrificed. So it says that the skin of the animals that have been sacrificed, it points towards the atonement which Jesus Christ will bring. Um, so maybe you can just take down two verses which explain this idea. You have Genesis chapter 3 verse 21. And if we can have someone read out that, Genesis 3.21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothes them. It says here in this verse that God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Why did God not make eco-friendly clothes? He could have used plant fibers, right? He could have, uh, you know, used very, um, he could have used jute or, you know, uh, uh, the cotton and things like that to make clothes for them. But instead, God chooses to kill an animal and use the skin of that animal to make covering for them. So, in that sense, it clearly points towards what Jesus Christ will do. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, um, where it talks about Christ as the Passover lamb. So now we are clothed in the garments which have been made from the skin of the Passover lamb. And what kind of garments are these? They are white clothes of righteousness, which only Jesus Christ can give because he is the one who shed his blood for us and we have been cleansed through his blood so now we are covered in you know in symbolically we are covered by his sacrifice so um, the 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 skin garments which god gave to adam and eve they are actually pointing towards what jesus christ will do one day so in that sense that also is a shadow the third shadow uh, it talks about here in your notes, it talks about Melchizedek as a shadow. Now, um, Melchizedek was a priest who followed the true living God. They had all kinds of priests in those days and they had all kinds of gods which they had created for themselves. But this man was different. Melchizedek worshipped the true living God and so God tells Abraham to give him a tithe uh, because this particular priest was serving the living God. He was serving Yahweh. And um, so in the New Testament, Jesus becomes a high priest like Melchizedek. 
Paul, uh, okay, not Paul, the writer of Hebrews tries to draw a comparison between uh, this high priest who lived in Abraham's time and he tries to draw a comparison with Jesus. So he, his, he makes a comparison between Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the ancient priest, and Jesus Christ, the high priest. How does he bring about the comparison? Because one is just a human being. Melchizedek is just a human king. On the other hand, Jesus Christ is uh, you know, divine. He is God. And he is the uh, final high priest for us, for us all. So he tries to bring a comparison between these two. Um, he talks about it in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. So in Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, it talks about how Jesus Christ will become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. In the sense, he will also become a high priest like Melchizedek, you know, serving the true and living God. And in Hebrews 7, 1 to 3, the writer tries to bring a comparison between these two. Hebrews 7, uh, 1 to 3. In verse 3, he says, we don't know anything about Melchizedek now because we don't have any historical records about him. You know, it's what you know the writer of Hebrews says. He says, we don't know who his ma father was. We don't know who his mother was. We do not know what his genealogy was because I think maybe they had lost the historical records about you know those particular events. So by the time uh, this writer has written this book of Hebrews, they, do, they don't know anything about the background of this Melchizedek. They only know that he's somebody who was the priest of the living God and Abraham actually goes and gives him a tithe. Uh, so uh, he says in verse 3, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God. So he says, this Melchizedek priest, he resembles Jesus Christ in the sense, um, the same way this Melchizedek, we don't know anything about his parents. We, Jesus Christ also did not have a beginning. He did not have parents who gave birth to him. He always existed. He was always eternal. So he tries to draw a comparison between the human priest and um, uh, and Jesus Christ, the high priest. So this also, Melchizedek is also like a shadow who is pointing towards um, Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, these are some of the things which we see in the, in, in the book of Genesis, some of the main things that we see. So uh, yeah, we are kind of out of time. So we'll just close with a... Okay, we'll just close with a word of uh, prayer. Um, so online students, if you have any questions at all from the session that we did today, please post them in the Google Classroom stream page. Okay, so and I'll try to see that I know that I'll try to answer all of those questions. Um, those of us who are here in the campus, you know, um, you can come to me and ask your questions anytime. But preferably during the class itself, if you can raise your hand and ask the questions, you know, that would make it easier. All right. So um, we'll just close with a word of prayer. Okay. So please, if we can all just, you know, just bow down our heads for a minute. Uh, let's do that. Lord, we could very briefly touch upon the things which are there in your word, O oh Lord, in the book of Genesis. Whatever little bit we have been able to cover today, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would just impress that upon our hearts. And whatever few learnings that we could learn from this particular book of Genesis, I pray that you will remind us to practice those things in our everyday life. Lord, we commit um, uh, the rest of our classes into your hands. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will make these classes meaningful, where we can actually learn something about you and learn to draw closer to you and grow in our faith as a result of it. So I, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us uh, in, um, in such a way that we are able to learn something, uh, that we are able to actually feel your presence and um, communicate with you uh, through these classes. So we pray that you would anoint us, help us to have hearts which will be willing to hear from you, and help us also, O oh Lord, uh, to practice the things that you teach us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.